Hello, this is Lecture 6 in Neurology. We're going to be talking about neurocognitive disorders, delirium, dementia, a number of diseases that I would call neurodegenerative, um, although not everything that we're going to be talking about today falls into that category. The, the essential uh, lecture objectives are first to be able to understand the difference between delirium and dementia, which is a really important concept. Um, and then understand a number of conditions, including uh, what we know about pathophysiology and causes, and a little bit about who is affected by them, risk factors, how we test for them, how we establish the diagnosis, and then a little bit about treatment. The um, first thing that I want to talk about is this concept of delirium. So delirium is a term that um, is used for patients who have an acute state of confusion or an acute confusional state that is related to underlying um, illness or injury. So delirium, unlike dementia, comes on rapidly. It does not develop slowly over months to years. Typically these are folks who very quickly become confused. Rather than being primarily a deficit in memory, it's more a deficit in attention and the ability to stay on task. And it is always associated with some underlying and usually reversible medical condition. This happens a lot to older patients in the hospital um, who have illnesses including things like myocardial infarction, urinary tract infection, um, after surgical procedures and anesthesia, people who are on medications, and that's particularly a few groups of medications. So sedative medications, psychoactive medications, pain medicines like opioids, um, uh, sedatives like benzodiazepines, and drugs that are anticholinergic uh, can in some cases induce delirium. And in many cases, it's a combination of drugs. So the polypharmacy that we see in older patients and in hospitalized patients can contribute to this um, acute confusional state. Substance use and misuse also may be involved. So the drugs may include alcohol and illicit drugs. The DSM five defines five features of delirium. So the, the primary characteristic of delirium is this inability to sustain focus, to, to, to pay attention. Um, it develops over a brief period of time like hours to days and is a change from baseline. And many people with delirium, their confusion will fluctuate uh, throughout the day depending on external cues and uh, medications and oxygenation and uh, diurnal rhythms. In most people who have uh, delirium, there will be a, other cognitive problems, including disorientation, um, sometimes trouble with perception, with language, with memory. And we can't explain these deficits by a, n another neurocognitive disorder. So somebody with dementia may develop delirium on top of the dementia, but somebody with delirium um, who has um, another uh, rapidly evolving situation like a stroke um, there may be another re or, or a, a reduced level of arousal. There are other explanations for the confusional state. And the final criteria or feature is that there's evidence that this problem is caused by either an acute medical condition, 
a substance uh, misuse or withdrawal or the side effects from medication. So people who are at high risk for delirium include older people, people who do have underlying brain diseases, including dementia, including um, stroke, prior stroke, um, other uh, things that, that have um, in prior to the acute delusional state may have caused some problems with with memory or cognition and then people with sensory impairment so people who have hearing issues and vision issues um, are at higher risk for delirium and precipitating factors actually I didn't finish this slide I see as I look at it include things like acute illness um, injuries this is not at all unusual when an older person has uh, something like a hip fracture goes into the hospital they are in pain they are away from their usual um, conditions their their home their people maybe their hearing aid or their glasses got left behind so all of those things can precipitate surgical procedures can precipitate delirium when we suspect an acute confusional state as delirium we want to do a good assessment including looking at their medications um, and adjusting medications uh, if they are on opioids maybe we want to try to control their pain in other ways if they are on anticholinergic drugs we want to look for alternatives um, we should certainly get labs to rule out other reversible causes of confusion and, and a urinalysis is extremely important because urinary tract infection is a common cause of delirium in elderly patients. We should do a drug and alcohol screen, thyroid studies, um, an ammonia level can be helpful because as we've talked about before, people with cirrhosis who are unable to appropriately um, metabolize proteins can develop high ammonia levels which can cause confusion. It's always important to do an EKG to make sure that there is not a heart condition. It might be helpful to do a CT scan particularly if there are any um, focal neurologic signs or any suspicion that there is a neurologic cause and occasionally an MRI. Most often those would be kept uh, especially the MRI kept in reserve for not when we are unable to identify another cause of this reversible state of confusion and we do additional testing depending on what we've learned by taking a good history often including informants like patient family members doing a physical exam and the results that we're getting back from things like imaging studies um, chest x-rays for instance blood counts, urinalysis, and so forth. When we do have um, in the inpatient setting, which is where you're going to see this, when we do see patients who have these problems, we try to avoid things like indwelling catheters and tubes and lines and drains um, because they tend to increase confusion. It's, it's extremely important to treat whatever we find is the cause. So if somebody has a urinary tract infection, certainly treat it. If it's an MI, we're going to take the, the actions that we need to take to best treat their condition. And then having familiar people around to reassure touching the patient, reassuring the patient, making sure that the faces of those, that the, their loved ones, if they're available, are accessible um, can be extremely important in calming the patients down. Even when somebody is extremely agitated, which can happen with delirium, um, you should try to avoid restraints. Um, and in some cases, low doses of antipsychotics, including haloperidol and ketamine, can be helpful in counteracting the confusion. It, it, ideally, we avoid this condition 
by making sure that our at-risk patients, so older folks, folks with prior um, brain problems, uh, remain socialized, have contact with people they know, get enough sleep, that we keep them well hydrated, that we involve them um, with appropriate sensory um, stimuli, avoid restraints, be very careful about the drugs that we use and the combinations that we use. That we use. Find out if the person has a hearing aid and see if you can get somebody to bring it or glasses because improving their ability to sense their environment will often radically improve the confusion. There aren't any medical treatments that have been shown to improve outcomes in folks with delirium. It is a common problem um, and just be sure that you uh, adequately search for a cause and address the cause um, and avoid drugs that are going to trigger worsening. So Benadryl is not something you should give uh, to folks in the hospital, older folks, for, for sleep because it tends to induce delirium. Um, so let's try to prevent it when we can find the cause, treat the cause. This, um, there are several osmosis videos that are in this lecture. I am not going to play them as part of the um, recording because there are issues with recording the sound. But I, I would strongly advise that you go through the PowerPoint and watch them because they are useful. The next thing that I want to talk about is dementia. Um, dementia is not a diagnosis. It's a condition that can develop because for a, a large potential number of causes. And when we look at somebody who does have con um, memory issues or cognitive deficits that are progressive and we're thinking about dementia, we always need to kind of look at whether it is actually dementia, whether it's a pre-dementia um, signifier like mild cognitive impairment, which is a precursor usually to Alzheimer's disease, or normal aging because people do become, um, ha have some problems with, for instance, certain kinds of memory with aging that aren't necessarily dementia. We don't have any current recommendations for screening for dementia, uh, but that's one of those things that could change and that you should probably keep an eye on recommendations for if you're in primary care. So dementia is defined um, in your textbook as an acquired generalized and usually progressive impairment of the content of consciousness. The level of consciousness is preserved at least until the very end. And so what this means is these people are not um, obtunded. They don't have an abnormal Glasgow coma scale. They're alert and arousable and speaking. But they may have problems in various cognitive domains, including memory, uh, the ability to reason, judgment, behavior, language, and others. In order to give someone uh, this label of dementia, their cognitive issues have to interfere with their um, ability to function in their normal activities, whether it's a job or, or, or a social milieu. In uh, people who are usually getting older and who we screen with something like the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, um, people who may be complaining or whose family members may be complaining of memory issues, if we diagnose 
mild cognitive impairment, that implies that even though they have some problems, uh, impairment in things like memory or judgment, that they are still able to function in their normal environment. We do know that given um, increased aging, about half of folks 85 and above have dementia. So this is an extremely common problem. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of the different kinds of dementia. When we see a patient who is complaining, we need to, as always, take a good history that includes a family history, that includes a careful assessment of their medications, including over-the-counter medications, their prior or current use of substances like alcohol and illicit drugs, um, and talk to them and to family members about whether their ability to function is declining and over what time frame has this decline been noticed. So most types of dementia are in that group of things that I called neurodegenerative diseases and they are progressive. Most of them are relatively slowly progressive over years, sometimes um, uh, over months to years, but usually over years to even potentially decades. Um, there are things that we know put people at higher risk for dementia that include a family history of diseases like Alzheimer's disease, but um, more importantly, certain known uh, heritable diseases like Huntington disease. Diabetes, hypertension, um, obesity, all can contribute to the risk for dementia, as does smoking. Repeated significant or, or significant head injuries put people at higher risk. Hearing loss puts people at higher risk for dementia, as well as delirium. Um, and some people feel that vitamin, chronic vitamin D deficiency is a contributor and chronic sleep deprivation. Um, we know that there are things that protect against dementia. Exercise, regular exercise being one of them. People who are um, not physically active uh, are at higher risk and activity seems to decrease risk. People with a higher level of education are at lower risk. Um, there is a lot of talk about mental stimulation decreasing the risk. It may be protective, but certainly um, remaining socially active seems to delay cognitive decline. So people who are involved in social activities have a higher level of what we would call cognitive reserve. So I talked about taking a good history. When we take a good history, we follow that up with a good physical exam. And here it's going to be a general physical exam, but with special emphasis on neurological exam, looking for focal neurological signs, which might suggest another cause for the cognitive issues and mental status testing. Um, in most primary care offices, you might use some uh, tool like the MINICOG um, or the MMSEM, yeah. Um, but using them serially can be helpful. So following up with people who have complaints of cognitive issues is important. And referring these folks for a neuropsychiatric evaluation can be helpful if you're unable to make that diagnosis um, based on information that you can get. We do those labs to um, rule out reversible causes. And those, rever those labs that we're going to get are going to be things like a CBC, 
Um, why is CBC? Well, a CBC could give us indications of potentially B12 deficiency, so anemia, um, and anemia in some cases in older people can result in some fatigue and potentially cognitive issues. Um, you're going to check thyroid, you're going to do uh, syphilis testing, probably do a good B12 level. Um, there, we'll talk a little bit more about labs in a later slide. Um, imaging wise, if you do a CT scan, it is done primarily to look for other possible causes for the cognitive decline. MRI is more sensitive to look for uh, atrophy in um, generally and in certain specific areas of the brain that tend to occur with certain specific diseases. But look for a treatable cause because about 10% of dementia is reversible or at least partly reversible by treating the cause. So things like B12 deficiency, chronic B12 deficiency can cause cognitive decline. Um, substance misuse, chronic subdural hematoma, because if you remember those subdural hematomas that happen slowly, the cognitive decline may be over months and um, treating that might be very helpful. Some tumors can cause cognitive issues and can be discovered and treated. And then thyroid disease, um, because hypothyroidism can certainly cause cognitive issues. And finally, syphilis. And I, you know, I've, I've probably told you my syphilis stories, but uh, older people with syphilis may present with dementia and you don't want to miss that because it is treatable. You might not be able to fully um, reverse the, the decline, but you can at least prevent further decline by appropriate treatment of neurocephalus. This slide is just kind of taking the things that we've talked about in um, the differences between delirium versus dementia. In folks with delirium, they may have an impaired level of consciousness. They may be alert, but they aren't able to consistently pay attention. Um, people with dementia aren't, don't have an impaired level of consciousness, except sometimes in, in very late stages of the disease. People with delirium, it's typically an acute problem. It typically fluctuates uh, even during the course of a day, whereas most of the causes of dementia are steadily progressive and all of them are chronic. People with acute confusional states may have um, things like uh, tachycardia, uh, autonomic hyperactivity, and be agitated, whereas people with dementia don't. And again, prognosis-wise, um, most delirium is reversible if we treat the underlying causes, whereas dementia is usually irreversible. We're going to now get into a number of specific causes of dementia, diseases that cause uh, chronic uh, degeneration of the nervous system leading to chronic uh, and progressive cognitive decline. And I want to start by saying that most of these neurogenerate, neurodegenerative disorders, while we don't fully understand their causes, um, involve misfolded proteins. And the proteins um, vary from disease to disease. So in Alzheimer disease, there are a couple proteins um, that are commonly misfolded, resulting in deposits of proteins in and around neurons. And in Alzheimer, the misfolded proteins are 
proteins called beta amyloid and tau. Uh, tau is also involved in a few other less common dementing diseases like frontotemporal dementia, something called progressive supranuclear palsy and corticobasal degeneration. Frontotemporal dementia is not that uncommon. The other two are not very common and tau is involved in all of those. In frontotemporal dementia there's another protein called TDP43 and something called FUS or fused in sarcoma. The alpha-synuclein is a set of proteins that we see um, in misfolded and deposited uh, inappropriately in and around neurons in two related diseases. Parkinson disease, which we will talk about primarily when we talk about movement disorders. Although Parkinson disease can develop dementia, okay? And then Lewy body disease or Lewy body dementia. Now some folks with Parkinson disease with dementia at autopsy will have these deposits of alpha synuclein that are called Lewy bodies. Um, but there are distinctions between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson disease that we'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Then Huntington disease, which is a um, inherited disease, an autosomal dominant inherited disease that is um, quite uh, serious and the protein is called Huntington or HTT. And then finally, there are some uh, dementias that result in misfolded proteins that are called prions and that are composed of a protein called PRP or prion protein that include Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD and then a couple of others that we won't talk about gerstmann streisler Schenker syndrome and fatal familial insomnia. So let's talk a little bit about Lewy body dementia. This is the second most common. Okay, so Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause of dementia. Lewy body dementia is the second most common neurodegenerative cause of dementia. It is not the second most common cause of dementia, but of, of these progressive dementias with neural degeneration, Lewy body is second to Alzheimer's disease. And it results in, or perhaps is caused by, these misfolded proteins that cause deposits in the brain of something called alpha-synuclein. And they stain in a particular way and are called Lewy bodies. Now, it might be apparent that that is a slide of brain tissue. Yes, you can do brain biopsies, but this is most often a diagnosis that's made on a clinical um, basis with definitive diagnosis being made at autopsy. This is the disease that uh, Robin Williams had that resulted in his suicide. Um, People with Lewy body dementia have degeneration um, of their uh, gray matter that results in um, some uh, loss of volume, which is what they're showing in those um, MRIs. Um, they often develop some similar motor symptoms to Parkinson's disease. So 
um, bradykinesia or, or slowing of movements, the, the dif difficulty with initiating movement. But the difference between here between Lewy body dementia and Parkinson disease is that in Parkinson disease, the movement disorder is what presents first and dementia develops in much later stages. Cognitive decline tends to start years after the onset of motor symptoms, whereas in Lewy body dementia, the symptoms of the um, neurodegenerative disorder of the cognitive decline begin first and um, and motor symptoms come later, usually months to years later. Lewy body dementia is kills people faster than Parkinson's disease as well. Um, if you screw just this is just a little point that I noticed when I was reading about this that if you're doing um, if you see somebody and there's complaint of cognitive decline and you decide to do some mental status testing the um, folks with um, Lewy body dementia um, or dementia with Lewy bodies I, you know I've seen it put both ways um, have typically have they have memory issues but their memory issues are less noticeable than their problem with uh, copying so these are folks who aren't going to be able to copy those intersecting pentagons or the clock face um, earlier than folks with Alzheimer's disease who are going to perhaps be able to do those things and have more problems with with memory there is some fluctuation um, in cognitive ability with Lewy body dementia, although it is progressive. It is very common for folks with Lewy body dementia to have visual illusions and hallucinations. They can be at early on just seeing things out of the corner of the eye to very detailed visual hallucinations, seeing somebody sitting on the bench next to them who isn't there. And then over time, they develop very similar symptoms to Parkinson's. So they may develop a tremor, they get bradykinesia, they get rigidity, and it's a cogwheel type rigidity similar to what we'll talk about in Parkinson's. They get balance issues um, and uh, a, a definite Parkinsonian picture. But as I said, that is after the dementia, not before. This is um, a serious problem that um, is hard to treat. It, it, as I said, it is more rapidly progressive than Parkinson's disease, and we'll talk about Parkinson's disease later in the course. Um, but we treat it similarly, and we treat the motor symptoms with the same kinds of medicine that we use in Alzheimer's disease. Um, carbidopa and levodopa, uh, drugs that are meant to provide um, more dopamine in cells that have become deficient in dopamine. Um, some of the Alzheimer's uh, drugs can be helpful in Lewy body dementia. So denepazil is a drug that I think um, increases acetylcholinester acetylcholine levels by blocking acetylcholinesterase, which if you'll remember is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine in the neuromuscular synapse. Um, finally, um, regarding Lewy body dementia and Parkinson's, people who die of Parkinson's disease also have Lewy bodies particularly if they have dementia. Um, and it's, it's two different causes of dementia, but with similar pathophysiology, just different uh, clinical courses. And again, here's an osmosis video that you might find helpful. Oops, sorry. Sorry for flipping around like that. The next thing I want to talk about is taking us on a slightly different path. 
you remember I said that Lewy body dementia is the second most common neurodegenerative cause of, of dementia. Well, vascular dementia is the second most common cause of dementia. So Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause. Vascular dementia is the second most common cause. And it differs from all these other um, conditions in that it is not caused by misfolded proteins. It's caused by cell death in the brain that results from strokes. So another name for vascular dementia is multi-infarct dementia. And it is progressive if people continue to have small um, strokes, but it doesn't progress smoothly. It typically progresses in, in um, steps as people lose additional portions of their brain. Um, Folks with vascular dementia often have hypertension as a pre-existing condition which contributes to the disease. They may develop hypertension when they get the stroke. You will see focal motor and sensory deficits that are related to the parts of the brain that have infarcted. Um, and over time, you'll notice this cognitive decline and impaired attention. Um, the, the one difference here is that in some cases we can find and treat the cause of the strokes that is resulting in progression of the dementia. Um, and if we can treat the hypertension, um, potentially treat causes of emboli, um, you know, atrial fibrillation, um, sometimes um, anticoagulation, all of those things might be helpful um, and we could perhaps delay the progression. Um, so you don't have a smoothly progressive course with vascular dementia. You have stepwise um, deficits usually. There is something called pseudobulbar affect these folks with vascular dementia, again because of the parts of the brain that are being involved, may have dysarthria, which is clumsy speech, dysphagia, which is difficulty swallowing, and sometimes when the frontal lobe is involved, they have unusual emotional um, symptoms. This is a brain that just trust me, shows a whole bunch of infarcts, large infarcts, small infarcts. And you remember we talked about lacunar infarcts, which were those um, little strokes, not many strokes, but smaller strokes resulting from branches of deep uh, of vessels that, that project deeper into the brain. Um, so when we suspect vascular dementia, even if we didn't have an acute stepwise change, we're going to do all of the things to work it up that we would do um, in the case of a TIA or a stroke to rule out underlying causes. We treat the hypertension, we treat potential sources of emboli, um, we recognize that folks with vascular dementia are at risk for progression because people with strokes are at risk for additional strokes. The mean survival after diagnosis with vascular dementia is, is only three to five years. And while it would make sense that things like antiplatelet drugs and statins might um, improve this condition, there is no evidence that they reduce the risk of subsequent events. It's important to understand that um, the symptoms of um, vascular dementia are entirely dependent on the region of damage. And here we have about a six minute video talking about vascular dementia um, and talking about what 
symptoms we tend to see with vascular dementia. Earlier, I mentioned um, something called frontotemporal dementia, and it is the third most common cause of neurodegenerative, if something's spelled wrong there, or there's a typo, neurodegenerative dementia after Lewy body dementia, so it's probably the fourth most common cause of dementia altogether. It is usually, um, I uh, can't think of the word, uh, not inherited, most, most frontotemporal dementia, you don't have a family history, but there, it, there are some families in which it is inherited. Um, these folks usually are diagnosed in their fifth, uh, sixth decade, between 50 and 60, and when they are imaged, we see unusual atrophy of the frontal and temporal lobes. This is another one of those diagnoses that is typically made um, primarily based on clinical attributes and imaging, but is confirmed at autopsy by the presence of inclusions of tau proteins in and around neurons. So tau proteins for frontotemporal dementia. And here's an MRI that if you remember what normal MRIs look like, there's just a great loss of gray matter here. There's, there's extra room, right? Um, the ventricles are bigger and, and there's extra space around the gray matter um, in both the frontal and the temporal lobes. So there, there aren't any tests uh, that will clearly make this diagnosis. I think over your careers, we will start to see more and more um, ability to make some of these diagnoses uh, by using biological markers in, thing, in CSF and perhaps in blood. So there's research on that for frontotemporal dementia, but th there are no tests right now. Um, the drugs that are typically used for Alzheimer's don't work with frontotemporal dementia. There are some people who have movement issues who benefit from le carbidopa, levodopa, um, and antidepressants may be somewhat helpful for some of the behavioral issues that can occur with frontotemporal dementia. So that's frontotemporal Lewy body disease and Parkinson's, alpha-synuclein, okay, frontotemporal dementia, tau, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, um, is that PRP, prion protein. So this is an interesting group of diseases. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is a disease that is apparently caused by misfolding of proteins that are called prions. And those prions, those particular proteins are in the CSF, in the brain and the spinal cord, but also in other places like organs, including the kidneys and spleen and liver, in lymph nodes, in eyes and in lungs. And um, some Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is inherited. Some Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is infectious. And some Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is just kind of out of the blue. That's pretty rare. So typical Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease doesn't present until late in life. People start to have symptoms between 55 and 75 that result in progressive neurocognitive decline. They have memory loss, they have behavioral problems, um, they may have some muscle issues, uh, myoclonus jerking, 
cerebellar issues, issues with balance and coordination of movement. Um, so physical manis manifestations as well as the cognitive and behavioral issues. Now there is a kind of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease that we call variant CJD that is related to ingesting these abnormal proteins and this is um, also uh, what, what is called you know the human form of mad cow disease so during the late part of the 20th century the 80s um, there was beef in England that was um, that contained these abnormal prions that was consumed by the general public that resulted in some hundreds of cases of young people developing this disease uh, CJD um, there have been uh, over the years a number of uh, several hundred cases of CJD that are iatrogenic that w resulted from transplants and from neurosurgical instruments that hadn't been properly cleaned after being used in people with this diagnosis. Um, transplant transmis transmission is very rare but it is of concern um, and and even uh, corneal transplants can result in CJD so one of the um, things that keeps you from being able to donate plasma is having had a corneal transplant or really any transplant because of the possibility of uh, transmissible disease and in the case of corneal transplants it's CJD um, The MRI in Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and this is using weighting, shows um, a lot of kind of hyper intense gray matter um, in, and in particularly along the surface of the cortex. So there's sort of this white ribbon in the gray matter, but also in the basal ganglia, um, which is why they sometimes have movement uh, issues. And here as an aside, I show you images. Nobody expects you to look at an image and, and make an interpretation or know what the disease is. This is because I feel strongly that sometimes pictures are helpful in understanding why an illness can be so globally um, devastating or why it has specific or localized signs and because they're fun okay they're interesting and they didn't have these when I was growing up as a PA briefly going away from misfolded proteins there are people who present with symptoms very suggestive of dementia but who have what we would call pseudo dementia they have they may be depressed there's something called functional cognitive disorder these are people who are going to come to you very anxious about that they're they can't remember people's names and they're losing their keys um, they're stressed out they probably don't have dementia most people with dementia aren't going to tell you they're losing their keys they're either being sneaky about it there they don't remember and they don't want to talk about their memory issues and they get defensive people with functional cognitive disorder they're talking about it and very concerned and they're often highly educated working people who are just anxious um, Obstructive sleep apnea can result in cognitive symptoms. Hypoxia certainly interferes with cognition. And insomnia um, and lack of, of getting adequate sleep can interfere with, with uh, cognition, can be associated with the depression and can result in um, cognitive decline that is reversible. And then finally, polypharmacy. So people who are on multiple drugs that are interacting with each other, some of them sedative, some of them anticholinergic, um, 
sometimes just readjusting their drug regimen will make all the difference and it's not actually dementia even though it may smell like dementia look like dementia and now we're going to talk about Alzheimer's disease again another really good osmosis video so I've said our second and third and whatever causes of, of uh, dementia well Alzheimer's disease is the Alzheimer disease is the kind of the elephant in the room it is the most common cause of dementia and it is extremely common um, it there are some risk factors for Alzheimer that um, are very clear increased incidence of Alzheimer with increasing age women are more likely to develop Alzheimer's disease than men people with family history um, and in and, and there are some specific syndromes and some less specific syndromes people who have deep a low education level and depression are at higher risk and then this group of things that affects um, lots of stuff having to do with with vessels and with just general health so smoking diabetes obesity and hypertension all contribute to the risk of um, Alzheimer's disease this ApoE4 genotype um, I'll talk about that a little later there are people who have strong family histories of Alzheimer's disease and particularly early onset Alzheimer's disease which is a very specific form of Alzheimer but then there are people who when tested have this ApoE4 or Epsilon 4 genotype that puts them at higher risk and and you may hear about that by people who've done things like 23andMe and gotten um, some information about their health risks there's some things that protect against Alzheimer's disease so we know that people who eat low-fat diets with lots of fruits and vegetables are less likely to have Alzheimer's disease and we don't know that changing your activity level and eating better decreases the risk although it would make sense that it would um, physical activity is really important for preventing Alzheimer's disease and then interestingly um, people with light to moderate alcohol consumption which I think is one drink a day up to one drink a day for women and up to two drinks a day for men um, have a lower risk of Alzheimer's compared to people who either don't drink at all or people who drink more than that so that's kind of interesting which doesn't mean you should start drinking if you don't I just read a very interesting article about that that actually people who are light to moderate drinkers who stop drinking increase their risk of Alzheimer's disease or there was a recent study like large population study that suggested that again um, not to say you should start drinking if you don't but uh, it's clear that drinking and there are other potential health risks with drinking alcohol so um, don't start if you don't drink don't drink more than a little bit so we know some things about what happens in Alzheimer's but we don't know why there are um, pathologically in the brain tissue there are three things that we consistently see and again when do you see those well with the brain biopsy do we do brain biopsies not very often so this is usually after death uh, at autopsy but these changes include something called neuritic plaques um, which are composed of this beta amyloid protein something cause called neurofibrillary tangles which are primarily um, composed of some of a protein called tau sorry 
I just got knocked on the elbow by a dog. That's why that happened. And then neuronal degeneration. If you um, look at the brain of somebody uh, before they're ever symptomatic, years before the onset of symptoms, um, they may have some of these findings. And over time, it is thought that these changes in the brain lead to clinical symptoms. So this is just a diagram that's trying to illustrate these um, kind of deposits of beta amyloid um, that are called um, plaques and that are made up of, um, of uh, a specific uh, protein. Um, and uh, amyloid precursor protein. Um, and then fibrillary, or these tangles. And I have a better picture on the next page. So tau um, is a protein that's involved in the formation of microtubules within the neuron. And these, these tau proteins get misfolded and hyperphosphorylated and uh, and interfere with neuronal um, function. So 10 years before symptoms, people have amyloid deposits. Um, it's when symptoms start that they start getting these uh, tank neurofibrillary tangles. And the beta amyloid plaques are both um, are, are outside of the nerve cells. The tangles are inside of them. And here is actual slide showing um, neurofibrillary tangles and deposits of beta amyloid uh, neuro neuritic plaques. So the arrowheads are uh, plaques, and the um, arrows, sorry, the arrowheads are plaques, and the arrows are. Uh, neurofibrillary tangles that are intracellular. And again, the plaques are amyloid protein formed of something called APP or amyloid precursor protein, beta amyloid. And the tangles are formed of this tau protein that is involved in microtubules. So people think there are a lot of potential um, hypotheses and there are some videos uh, links to videos on this page uh, talking about some of the hypotheses of how brain dysfunction cognitive dysfunction occurs in Alzheimer's disease um, we are gaining an understanding but we don't have a full understanding yet one of the things that happens in Alzheimer's disease over time is that the brain atrophies. But some parts of the brain atrophy more than others. And the hippocampus, which is a structure extremely uh, important to uh, making new memories, um, tends to atrophy more than the rest of the brain. So here we have a normal brain. Here we have a brain where we have um, shrinkage of the cerebral cortex. We have, because of brain atrophy, we have enlargement of the ventricles, similar to what I showed you earlier with another condition. And we have um, atrophy of the hip hippocampus. And this is just another an image showing bilateral hippocampal atrophy. Frankly, I think this is the hippocampus and here we just have a lot more space than we ought to have. This slide probably should have a better um, um, title because this slide is discussing um, in general the beta amyloid theory of uh, Alzheimer's disease, but in specifically, um, this is, we know a fair amount about this from people who have a unusual familial form of Alzheimer's disease that makes up about 1% of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And these are people 
who inherit abnormal um, mutations of that amyloid precursor protein called APP and therefore they form too much of this beta amyloid which gets deposited in the brain. Even though it's 1% of Alzheimer's disease patients, it's about 60% of patients who have early onset Alzheimer's. So most people with Alzheimer's develop it later in life, um, typically um, after the age of 60. People who start to develop Alzheimer's earlier than that, so between the ages of 30 and 50, early onset Alzheimer's, EOP, um, may often have this familial autosomal dominant form of Alzheimer's disease with abnormal uh, APP um, amyloid uh, precursor protein. Um, interestingly, people with Down syndrome who live into their uh, middle age commonly develop Alzheimer's disease in their 50s or around you know late 40s early 50s because they have an extra copy of the APP gene and they make excess beta amyloid and the beta amyloid gets deposited and plaques are formed. Um, and then I mentioned earlier that there is this apolipoprotein epsilon 4 gene mutation that um, increases people's risk for Alzheimer's disease and we don't understand how it works or why it happens but that risk is not for early onset Alzheimer's it's an increased risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease. Most people with Alzheimer's disease start with mild cognitive decline. They begin to have cognitive uh, decline, which may be uh, detectable by testing. With impaired, uh, over time, they develop increasingly impaired short-term memory. Then they become, they, they develop impairment about kind of orientation to time and to place and as the disease progresses they start having they lose words they start having difficulty naming things they start having difficulty finding words their speech becomes much less rich they start having difficulty with calculating with with arithmetic and they may develop some movement disorders like a, a shuffling wide gait um, with time, they lose their ability to interact appropriately in social situations. In some cases, they develop psychotic symptoms and agitation. Um, and I mentioned some movement disorders. And at the end of life, uh, they typically have lost their ability to speak, have lost their ability to um, ambulate, so they're often bedridden or chair ridden and um, they develop incontinence. So Alzheimer progression, um, death usually occurs within about five to 10 years after the onset of symptoms and four to eight years after the diagnosis because there's usually a little bit of a gap between the onset of symptoms and the diagnosis. And that is extremely variable. Some people live for longer. You know, I talked about um, taking a good history, doing a good physical exam, considering doing um, um, neuropsychiatric testing, which is something where you would refer the person to a psychologist or a psychiatrist who specializes in neuropsychiatric testing usually a psychologist. You're going to do some tests to rule out alternative diagnoses, including just sort of general chemistries, a CBC, liver function tests, and then syphilis, uh, thyroid, and B12. You've got to check those things. Um, in some cases, an LP is done looking for certain uh, 
biological markers that suggest an increase in amyloid protein, but they're not yet routinely recommended and they don't make the diagnosis. And there's currently a lot of research on plasma biomarkers so that, you know, there are circulating proteins and substances that may be indicators of uh, Alzheimer's disease or of uh, pre-Alzheimer's disease. They're not yet um, recommended or, or probably even available, although I think the CSF tests are available, um, but not necessarily used. And then imaging to make sure that in certain situations you've ruled out something else that might be causing the problems. So people with earlier onset um, Alzheimer's symptoms are generally imaged. If the symptoms have been progressive over less than two years, the person should be imaged. Um, if they have focal asymmetric neurologic signs or if the clinical picture suggests normal pressure hydrocephalus, in which case you'd likely have papilledema um, and other potential uh, things suggesting that, then the kinds of imaging would be just a non-contrast, sorry, there's another one of those funky typos, a non-contrast head CT, MRI looking for atrophy. Um, the positron emission tomography is um, looking at uh, glucose metabolism. Um, hard to get insurance to pay for that, but in somebody presenting with atypical symptoms or early symptoms, that might be positive. Um, so, uh, looking for less glucose metabolism in the temporal and parietal lobes, and I think they can actually detect amyloid with a PET scan. The treatment of Alzheimer's disease is definitely a team event. It requires, you know, us providers, but in conjunction with lots of support, clearly including nurses and social workers, family members and caregivers, nutritionists, you know, anybody who can help should be involved in the team. There are medications not yet that necessarily slow the progress of Alzheimer's disease, but may treat symptoms. Um, so I think this, this statement is still true, that no currently available treatment has been shown to reduce existing deficits or to arrest disease progression. And I'm going to say something here that I'll say in class, which is that I went through all of these lecture notes and I would suggest that you probably, while I am not likely to get into deep weeds from those lecture notes, that there are things in those notes that you should have written down and that are important and that I might test you on. I did, I took out the bullshit there. I said it. Okay. Um, I also took out all of the current, uh, page numbers because they change from year to year and they weren't current currents. So how do we treat Alzheimer's? Well, in Alzheimer's disease, um, we know that increasing certain neurotransmitters can be helpful. Um, and so there are um, anticholinesterase agents and cholinesterase inhibitors that keep the acetylcholinesterase at the neuro, um, at, at the uh, synapse between two neurons from breaking down acetylcholine, so allowing the acetylcholine to work more effectively. And it doesn't change the course of the disease, but it may help in function, at least for a while. So these are drugs that are given to folks with Alzheimer, Rivastigmine, Galantamine, Denepazil, and Tacrine. You don't have to know the names of these drugs. Denepazil is, uh, has fewer side effects than some of them and is once a day and obviously 
especially in a disease like Alzheimer's, it's important to simplify uh, medi medications. Um, and, but rivastigmine also comes in a patch that, that smooths delivery. There is a class of drugs called NMDA receptor antagonists by binding to these receptors and blocking glutamate, which is another neuro neurotransmitter. Um, it's a stimulatory neurotransmitter, so blocking it may uh, benefit some folks with moderate to severe Alzheimer, and it can be used in combination with denepazil. There is a drug called galantamine that also works on acetylcholine and uh, helps the nicotinic cholinergic neurons to increase the amount of acetylcholine that's released that's used in some folks with mild to moderate Alzheimer. And all of those drugs have some use. As I said, some of them can be used in combination. Um, none, they all may help symptoms at least for a period of time. Um, they all quit working after a while and this disease does continue to progress. The most recent drug released, uh, approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's disease is pretty controversial. It's aducanumab, it's obviously a monoclonal, an monoclonal antibody. Anything that ends with that MAB is a monoclonal antibody. And it is a uh, drug that is given, it's a very expensive drug that is given monthly by IV infusion um, that has been recommended for use in early Alzheimer disease. And the results in the clinical studies were somewhat promising but mixed, which is why there are people who strongly object to the FDA having approved it on an accelerated tract. And, you know, this is one of those drugs that, you know, five years from now, we may realize that it was the wrong thing to approve it, or it may just be, turn out to be the best thing ever. It does have potential serious side effects, including uh, brain edema, which is reversible, and um, small uh, brain bleeds. And this is just a chart showing those medications, the class that they're in, other than the monoclonal antibody. Um, here, what does it say? It says, know this, don't know this. I didn't take that out. I should have taken that out. I took out most of the bullshit, but I didn't take that one out. I'm not going to ask you about the drugs. I'll leave that to Dr. King. She can ask you about the drugs. There are other potential treatments for Alzheimer's. Um, the, the, you know, plasma exchange. So um, there have been some studies on removing uh, the plasma of people with Alzheimer's and replacing it with donor plasma, which may decrease the amounts of circulating abnormal proteins. Um, promising, but again, that would be potentially even way more expensive um, and difficult for uh, than than the monoclonal antibody monthly infusions, and we'll we'll just have to wait and see. Clearly, there's a lot of money in research being um, put into Alzheimer. So that's my lecture for today. If you have questions, ask them in class or email me. Um, and this is an area where I suspect there will be strides during your careers and where being a lifelong learner will both protect you from Alzheimer's disease and help you treat your patients who have it. So you take care. I have to figure out how to get out of here. I can't see. That's always an issue. I think that'll do it. Nope.